Hi, my name is Paul from Physics High. In 1932, the understanding of the atom was pretty much complete. Basically, they were made up of protons, neutrons in the nucleus and the electrons around them. But then in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, there was a whole range of particles discovered that could not be explained by using the concepts of protons, neutrons and electrons. We basically had a particle zoo. And so what scientists wanted to do was try to figure out, is there some sort of model that could explain all these particles? So in the 1960s, Murray Gell-Mann developed this, what we know as the standard model. And I cover this in a video called the standard model. But it's all good and fine to have a model that explains the particles, but do quarks and bosons actually really exist? So today I'm gonna to be looking at the experimental evidence that validates the standard model. So stay tuned. So as I've stated here, we have a whole range of particles that were discovered in the 50s and the 60s that could not fit into a scheme of protons and neutrons and electrons. They had various properties that could not be explained that, that way. Let's quickly review what Marigold Man did. What he basically did is organize the particles by ways of their properties. And in particular, we're looking at the properties of spin, the property of strangeness, and the property of charge. And so he developed this grid here, and when he developed this the grid, he was able to fit a very number of particles in this particular hexagonal pattern. As a result, he was able to hypothesize that there was some sort of underlying principle at play here because we had this lovely arrangement. He did this for the whole range of other particles. So by adding an extra line in terms of a strangeness of one, and in this case we have spin zero, he was able to place all of these particles here. And these are the particles that we refer to as mesons. Thirdly, when adding another charge to the situation, he was able to place all these particular particles in this place. And he was also able to actually predict a particle, that is the omega. At the time that Murray Gell-Mann actually devised this model, the omega hadn't been discovered yet. But interestingly enough, he predicted it and within months it was actually discovered, which validated the model. From this model, he came up with this system called the quark model. And you see what he developed was this idea of three different quarks. We have the up, the down, and the strange. He said the up quark has a charge of positive two thirds. And the down and the strange quark had a charge of negative one third. And using that principle, he was able to explain the combination of what we refer to as baryons and mesons. And so you can see here we have baryons here, they're made up of three quarks, we have a spin of a half, and you can see the combinations that he used. He used that pattern to develop that. Those that had spin zero, these are our mesons. You can see what we have here is our up quark and our strange. And I've changed this color. This color is meant to be showing that this is an anti-strange, an anti-particle. And then on the other side, we see all these spin with three over two. And again, they're made up of a whole range of quarks here in different combinations. But there are two possible problems. And the first problem is this. There's a concept called the Pauli exclusion principle, which basically says that two fundamental particles cannot coexist with exactly the same um, quantum numbers in the same place at the same time. And those quantum numbers are basically referred to as their energy, their charge, and their spin, and so forth. Now, if I have, let's say, an up and another up, and I'm making a proton here, and I create a down, you say, well, I've got two up quarks. Well, in actual fact, they could have a spin. Now, what is spin? Well, spin is fundamental property. And the way we liken it is like a spinning top. Now, it's not really spinning, but as a result, it has a polarity that either points up or points down. So for example, my up quark can actually be that up quark. But I can also have an up quark that also can be down. So the fact that is this act pointing down means it's actually different. It has a different spin. One is a positive half spin, one is a negative half spin. So in the case of making my proton, in this case, I have two up quarks, but I can have different quarks. So if I can have an up that has a spin up, I can have an up quark that is a spin down, and then of course I can also have my down quark, which could be an up or down, such as so. So you can see now what we have is an up and a down and an up. So I actually have a, a spin, what we call a half spin. And so this is allowable. The problem is this. What if I wanted to make that omega minus? And the omega no minus is basically three strange quarks. And the problem there is, is that if I bring those three together, I can have a spin up one, such as this, a spin down one, such as so, and then I can have, well, hold on here. 
I can have spin up or down, but now we have a problem is automatically I have two ups in the same direction and that's not allowed. So here's a problem. The fact is, is this quark model has a fundamental problem in that we can't have two quarks with exactly the same set of quantum numbers. So how do we solve that? Well, the issue that it solved was theorized in 1964 by the idea of color. Now, let me just explain here. This is not color in the way we normally talk about color. This is talking about what we call as a color charge. The quarks have a color charge. So like electrons and protons have a positive and negative charge. So you have two versions of those charges. Quarks can have three different charges. And so we have RGB or red, green, and blue. And when they combine, it becomes neutral. So red and green and blue become white. So we see that as a neutral charge. That allows for a difference. So for example, if I wanted to make my omega, I can use a red, a green, and a blue to make my omega. You know, I've got three S's here, but because I have red, green, and blue, they combine to give white. So we have neutrality in terms of color charge. Now the other side here, you see these little lines here, and these are our antiquarks. That's also possible. So if I wanted to make a meson, Again, the principle here is about color charge. But in this case, what happens with a meson is, is that you produce, let's say, and I'm gonna choose just the green one here, for example. I could have a green one here, and then I have an anti-green here. Now, why do I have an anti-green here? It's because that cancels out. So we have a neutral color charge, even though we may have a different type of charge here. We may actually have a negative charge or a positive charge or no charge in terms of electrical charge. Now, just one little point here. In a lot of textbooks, they'll refer to as the color of quarks so in terms of the color quarks in terms of red, green, and blue for your normal quarks. And then they usually use the idea of magenta, cyan, and yellow, which are the opposite or the complementary colors. I'm avoiding that this here because actually it's probably more intuitive to actually refer to it as the lines here, because if you don't fully understand color theory, that doesn't become very intuitive. But having these lines here makes it really clear that we're talking about the anti-red here versus the normal red here. The lines is anti-green versus the normal green. Now, there is a research article published by Jeff uh, Wiener from CERN, and I'm gonna put that in the description below as to why I've gone that route. Now, the other particular problem with particular of Murray Gell-Mann's view was that this partial charge was not really accepted. So we had two thirds, of course, for our ups and negative one third for our downs and our strange, uh, and they are reversed in terms of the antiparticles. Murray Gell-Mann actually didn't like the model as well. He said the idea that mesons and baryons are made of primarily of quarks is hard to believe. In other words, what he was saying is, is that it was a mathematical principle to explain why we get all these fundamental particles, but he didn't think necessarily it actually existed in reality. Well, that's gonna soon change. And how's that going to change? We need to talk about the experiments now from here on in. And so the particular experiment I'm gonna be dealing first with is the experiment that occurred at SLAC, which stands for the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, and it's based in California. And we have here a large electron accelerator that accelerates electrons up to 20 giga electron volts. And inside the main building here, you can see this large building at the bottom here, is a series of detectors that we're gonna examine a little bit closer. The basic idea with these accelerators is by smashing particles together into other particles and watching what happens, you can determine some properties. Now, have you heard that before? I'm sure you have. You may have heard, of course, of the Rutherford scattering experiment. In this case, we have an alpha emitter. This case is from polonium. And alpha particles are fired at gold, foil, and the scintillations of the detecting screen allowed us to develop the model of the atom that is referred to as the planetary model. So this is actually called a scattering experiment. And so we have alpha particles scattering off our gold foil, and by measuring the pattern of the angles of the scattering, then what we get here is some sort of understanding of the nature of the gold atom. Now, what's really important here is, is that this scattering experiment is often referred to as an elastic scattering experiment. It's elastic because the energy of the alpha particles doesn't change in terms of before and after. And secondly, you're not affecting the actual gold nuclei as we go on. At Stanford, the experiment here is referred to as our deep inelastic scattering experiments, or often referred to as DIS. Now, what does that mean? Now, at SLAC, or the Stanford Linear Accelerator, they're firing electrons at protons. 
And so I have my little electron here, which is our blue dot and our red proton here. And when this is going to be inelastic because some of the energy of the electron is transferred to the proton. It's going to disturb it in such a, some way. Now what's happening here? The reality is, is that the electron actually has a wavelength. That wavelength, of course, is dependent on its momentum. So the faster you fire the electron, the smaller the wavelength that this electron has. But if it has a smaller wavelength, it can actually resolve any details within the particular proton. So in other words, if the wavelength of my f um, electron is the size of the proton, we wouldn't be able to use the electron to detect anything that's smaller in here. But if the wavelength of my electron, remember due to the De Broglie relationship, then if there is any sort of structure inside there, then the electron's wavelength could actually um, be able to detect that, which is referred to as something called uh, the resolution. So let's have a quick look up at the setup. So here is a jar of liquid hydrogen. So we've got basically a source of protons. Then we fire electrons at a particular high velocity and they fire at a velocity of up to 20 giga electron volts. And from that, you get, get scattering. Now the amount of energy transfer that occurs at the proton level basically is determined also by the scattering and the energy of the electrons. In other words, if you now measure the electron's angle and also energy by way of its momentum, you can get some sort of understanding of the structure of the proton. So the setup basically looks like this. This is the top view of the detector. My electrons are coming in on the side here. And then what we have here is a series of detectors that are movable such like that. Now the benefit of this is that you can determine the angle to actually get the detector. So this is over here is in essence a uh, spectrometer which measures the actual electrons as they arrive. But this allows you to work out the angle. How does it know the actual momentum? Well, if we look at a sign view, you will see here that the detector is actually curved. So the electrons are coming in here, and of course this can turn around as we saw in the top view in a moment. But you can also see that we can actually bend it. And the amount of bending that occurs by way of the fact of what we call the, the Lorentz force will determine basically where this is going to be detected. So in other words, by measuring the radius of curvature, you can work out the momentum and therefore you can work out the energy of the electron. So the whole idea of the slack experiment is to determine the angle of the deflections and the momentum and therefore the energy of the electrons. What results did they actually get? And this is critical. So this is the result here, and I'm not going to go into great detail of interpreting the results. There's quite heavy physics involved here, but I'm going to basically pull out some of the key points here. If we look carefully, we have a line here that is the assumed elastic collision. In other words, this line that we have down here is the line that would have expected if the electrons interact with the protons elastically. In other words, that assumes that the proton internally has no specific structure. It's homogeneous in all tense and purposes. But that's not the results they got. The results they got are the results that you see up here from the three different detectors that they have. And what they particularly noted here is now that the proton is not homogeneous, it actually contains point-like structures. So this is the first step in validating the quark model, but we're not there yet. The second thing they discovered is this. By mapping basically their spin, and again I'm not going to go into the great deal of the physics of how they did this, they discovered that all these point-like structures had half spins, which is what Murray Gell-Mann predicted about his quarks. Finally, by comparing the results with experiments done at CERN, and this is called the Gargamel, which used basically neutrino scattering, they determined that the quarks had fractional charge. That is the two thirds and the negative one third. So in essence, we've got three aspects of the experiment that occurred at SLAC and at CERN verified basically that these internal structures had points, positions, they had half spin and they had fractional charge. Now, when Richard Feynman looked at the results here, he already had an idea of the model that he referred to as the parton model. That is, the proton was made up of parts. And so then in subsequent years, that model became the parton quark model. People could see that the partons were analogous to the quarks that Murray Gell-Mann had predicted in the early 60s. Here's the sort of 
evidence of the fact of quarks. So now I have a model of a nucleon, or more generally speaking, a hadron, that is basically made up of three quarks. And they're buzzing around inside the proton or the neutron, and at particularly at very high speeds, close to the speed of light. And the theory that underpins this is referred to as quantum chromodynamics and basically was developed in the early 70s, much at the same time when experimentalists were working on the particle accelerators detecting various different types of particles. To understand quantum chromodynamics requires a lot more study and certainly you will probably cover it in greater detail at third or fourth year levels in university. But I want to highlight a couple of things. The first thing is, is that apart from spin and electrical charge and of course mass, quarks have a property called color charge. Remember, this is not related to the color that we normally associate with. It's just that there are three different forms and it sort of makes sense to use the RGB ID as a sort of a label. Secondly, the fact is, is that the force that exists between the quarks is actually the strong nuclear force. And the strong nuclear force is mediated by a boson, which is now referred to as the gluon. And the interesting thing is, unlike electrical uh, forces that gets weaker as you pull them apart, in terms of quarks and the gluons that hold them together, the force of attraction is actually quite strong. It's very weak, very close together, but as you pull them apart, the force actually increases and it's a much greater strength of attraction. One of the major problems was the fact that if quarks exist, why can't we find quarks by themselves? And the understanding came about by the discovery of the forces that exist between the quarks. And what basically happens is, much like pulling a rubber band that you pull across, the quarks themselves actually resist any temptation of pulling them directly apart. In fact, if you have a quark separated by one centimeter, the force between them is equivalent to about 15 tonnes. And so what happens is, is that if you do have particles scattering inside the nucleus and somehow punches a quark out, that quark leaves, but the energy that's required is so high that in the process of the quark leaving, we have energy converted to matter. And so you have the development of two other particles, a quark and its associated anti-quark, which means that my quark that is leaving now is leaving with an anti-quark associated with it. And that process continues along as it's stretched along. And in essence, when you look at those images at CERN, for example, in the Large Hadron Collider, you see these streams coming out of these collisions. These are basically jets of these quarks streaming out, but in the process as they stream out, they're creating their, another particle, so they're actually streaming out in pairs in successive order. So in other words, quarks don't exist by themselves. As soon as you try to separate them out, you actually create more quarks. So now we'll have a look at the standard model. Now remember, Margell Mann only predicted an up, a down, and a strange quark. But subsequent work predicted other particular quarks and bosons as well. Here is just a sample. The child quark was predicted in 1970, and it was actually discovered in particle accelerators such as the one at SLAC in 1974. The bottom quark was also discovered in 1977, only predicted four years uh, prior to that. The top quark was predicted in 1973 and was eventually observed at the accelerators at Fermilab in 1995. And then of course there's the famous Higgs boson, the particle that's important to give the quarks their mass. Now that was predicted in 1964, and was, of course, famously announced at CERN in 2012. So here is our final model of our structure of a hadron. And in this case, I've got a proton. And I've got three color quarks built in there. And those little springs represent the basically the strong nuclear force that holds them together. But is it our final model? This is probably a better model once again. So what do we have here? Well, you'll see that our proton isn't made up of just three quarks. No, we've got three valency quarks, which is the green, the blue, and the red that you see there. And then there's a whole bunch of squiggly stuff. Those are our gluons just buzzing in and out. But those gluons interact to produce quarks and anti-quarks in and out of existence inside the proton. And so in essence, our proton isn't a sphere with 
things built in it. No, no, it's basically those three valency quarks and other quarks popping in and out of existence and a multitude of gluons buzzing around inside there. And the only thing is that is keeping them on the edge, edge here is basically the strong nuclear force that's holding them all in together. In essence, the proton edge is the boundary that stops them from going any further. So you can see that our model isn't necessarily complete after all. And in fact, the question now is, is the quark made up of smaller particles? Well, we just don't know. And in fact, that's probably something for future researchers to go on. Well, I hope that has given you a greater insight on how the model of the standard model has been validated by a series of experiments in subsequent years, and therefore show the actual true existence of the quarks and the bosons and other parts of the standard model. Please like, share and subscribe. Put a comment down below if this has been helpful to you at all. And please feel free to drop a comment down below if you have another, if you have a question or just simply want to make a comment. My name is Paul from Physics High. Take care. Bye for now.